Ellis. As a teenager, I have very fond memories of my dad taking me to see a new James Bond film at our local cinema. And today, I must confess that one of my relaxations is to watch or read a really good whodunit. I must admit, some of the crime dramas, especially some of the scandy ones on BBC4, are quite gruesome. I sometimes find myself hiding behind a pillow. But I wonder who you would recognise. Good, Vera. Now, this is for the youngsters, okay? So adults just keep quiet, see if any of the youngsters can just, this one. Sherlock Holmes, well done. Okay, some of the uh, youngsters might not know the next one. Beck. Oh, they couldn't get that one at Dale, but yes, Beck. It's a BBC Four one, it's uh, quite good, it's a Swedish one. Oh, Father Brown. I'm not an afternoon television person, but I know it's on quite regularly on some of the uh, sides. Montalbano. Montalbano. Oh, I love Montalbano. Only for the scenery views yeah. in Sicily. Yes. <laughs> the fact she's a good-looking Italian man's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the house they use on his programme is a and b and my <laughs> sister and I has always wanted to go and stay there. <laughs> yes. So Vera, Sherlock Holmes, Beck, Father Brown, Malton Barno. So today we have come to our next Children of the Bible summer series, and I've been given, hmm, well, who is the child I'm speaking about today? Considering our Bible reading is probably one of the most well-known Bible stories, our reading does not actually mention the child by name. This certainly seems to be a bit of a whodunit. That was our reading. But who? We need to find out who is this child. What did she do? How did she rescue her baby brother? And more importantly, why did she rescue her baby brother? So who? Who is this child? We perhaps, like every good who done it, we need to look at the evidence. And I think one of the main pieces of evidence, you've still got your Bibles open, youngsters particularly, have a look at verse 10. Let the youngsters have a look and see if we can work out who it might be. Verse 10 seems to be the biggest clue. There it is, written up there on the screen for you. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses. So... Who is the child? Any idea who the sister of Moses is? Lydia, Hannah, Abigail, Phoebe, others? Some of the adults want to help. Any of the adults know who the sister of Moses is? Miriam. Miriam, yes, well done. It's yeah. Miriam. One of my uh, great nieces is her middle name is Miriam. So we've got Miriam. What do we know about Miriam? Anybody know anything about Miriam? Anybody want to have an idea of how old she is? Lydia, Hannah, Abigail, Phoebe, anybody know? She's a little girl? Go on, give a guess. Twelve. A bit younger than that. Well, according to my research, although we, we sometimes question research, don't we? She was considered to be about five years old. Yes, I know. Thank you, Marilyn. Your face looks bright. Yes, a little bit of detective work. I discovered that she was five years old. She had a younger brother called Aaron, and he 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 is uh, in later in um, in the Bible. But this Marion, do we know much about her? Well, verse one perhaps gives us a clue. Now, a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. So Miriam's parents were Levites which means they were from the tribe of Levi, which means they were one of the tribes of Israel that was descended from Levi, the son of Jacob. Our Bible reading doesn't actually give us their names, but we know they are Amran and Jochebed. And as I say, a little bit of detective work, I've discovered she's about five years old, although someone else did suggest to me she's more like 12, so we're not quite sure. But what did Miriam do? So where is the next piece of evidence? I think verse 4 could help us. 
Verse 4 said, she stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Yes, she watched. She stood there amongst the reeds, watching her baby brother Moses on the banks of the Nile. A reading doesn't say that the mother asked Miriam to keep an eye on what happened to her baby brother, but simply says that his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Just imagine for a moment, a baby you've hidden for three months. She had to let him go in case he was discovered. And so the mother made a basket of papyrus, coated it with tar and pitch to make it watertight, and placed the basket amongst the reeds along the Nile. Goodness, how desperate that mother must have been to try and save the life of her baby boy. Think if I'd been that mother, I'm sure I would have wanted to see if anyone found him or rescued him. So maybe she did ask Miriam, we don't know. <coughs> so here is this little girl, Miriam, waiting and watching what would happen. It doesn't seem to sound like a five-year-old. How many five-year-olds would just hide away and not say anything? But maybe things were very different then. And so what did Miriam watch happening? We could look at verses five and six in particular. And the answers want to shout out what is in verses five and six. What happened? Any thoughts? Yes? Okay. So Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. So they watched Pharaoh's daughter going down to bathe. And then she watched her maid fetching the basket. And she watched the reaction as they saw the baby boy in the basket. Oh my goodness, the baby has been discovered. At this point, Miriam must have been really frightened. For suddenly, her baby brother had been found. But no! She heard Pharaoh's daughter feeling sorry for the baby she'd found. For we're told that after opening the basket, Pharaoh's daughter had immediately fallen, well, taken pity on the baby. Perhaps she fell in love with the baby. And then what did Miriam do? Verse 7 is our clue, I believe. Bit of evidence there. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, she offered. She offered to get help for someone to look after the baby. Cool, oh, that's quite a thing, isn't it? To go off and get a, a, woman, a Hebrew woman to care for him. As he was still so small, only three months old, he needed feeding until he was old enough to be weaned. So I guess we look at how. How did she save her baby brother? Well, as I say, the evidence was there in verse seven. Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for the baby, for the Hebrew women to look after the baby? <laughs> and who did Miriam go and fetch? Yes, they went to fetch his mother. Oh, isn't God's hand upon this? The girl went and got the baby's <clears throat> mother, the best person who could have been chosen. So off she went to get her mother. Just imagine how excited the mother was. So my thoughts are, how did she save him? She saved him because she was being courageous. She was being a protective younger sister, older sister. How did she save him? Through her quick decision and quick thinking, she was able to reconnect Moses with his own mother. This was critical to Moses, as this no doubt helped to shape and have a dramatic impact on the first few years of his life. Even as a young girl, Miriam was smart enough to see the situation happening and made a quick and decisive decision. And to make it even better, and you can read that in, I think it's verse 8, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. My goodness, not only was she getting the baby, but she was being paid to look after her own baby. Wouldn't you like that? You know, a nanny being paid to look after the baby. As one writer puts it though, by the grace of God, Miriam save, helped save the infant Moses. So there was who she is, what she did, and how she did it. But why did Miriam help? The evidence is perhaps in verse three, that she wanted to protect him. But when he could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket, coated it with tar and pitch, placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. 
She wanted to protect Moses, or the baby, from being killed by Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Miriam, of course, had been brought up in the slave quarters of Egypt, with her childhood being one of great fear and uncertainty. I think as a young child, Miriam would have known the dangers that her baby brother brought to the family. She would have known that if a mother had given birth to a baby boy, it would be killed by the authorities, because the king had ordered all baby boys to be killed by drowning them in the River Nile. But her parents were godly people who trusted in God of Israel, but the king of Egypt hated her people. Miriam, I believe, would have experienced her mother trying to keep the baby hidden away. Just imagine the scene. Miriam must have been terrified that the king's daughter would hand over her baby brother to her father, the king. So why did she help? She wanted to protect her baby brother and save him from being killed. So I assess what's important for us. What can we learn from Miriam? This little girl who was doing something amazing, perhaps something that none of us could consider doing. Well, first of all, she was courageous. She had the courage. She had the courage to watch over her baby brother. Second, she was a helper. She was practical. She was brave. She was obedient. I'm quite sure her mother had coached her, so she helped by watching over her. She was thirdly a risk taker. She risked being found out. Are we ready to risk, take a risk in sharing God's love with someone? To perhaps, to a school friend, perhaps when you go back to school next term and they ask you what you did in your summer holidays. Are you ready to be a risk taker and share what you did? They might laugh at you. Work colleagues, I certainly used to have a work colleague who would just almost jeer at what I used to do on Sundays. They couldn't believe that I would spend my Sundays going to church. Fourth, fourthly, she, was, she used her initiative. She had been hiding in the, in the reeds watching, and then she offered the help of a Hebrew woman, knowing her mother could nurse the baby. What can we use our initiative for? Is there somebody who's struggling, who perhaps you've not ignored, but perhaps not realised the need of them? Perhaps we can use our initiative to show God's love by helping someone. She was also sensitive, very mature for her young age. And lastly, she trusted. Her parents trusted in God, and it seems that she did too. Wonderful, <coughs> wonderful qualities, and she displayed these at a very early age. Do you notice the acronym I've built? Yeah, Wendy? Christ. I thought, how can I work something together? It became Christ. And I thought, yes, that is Christ for each of us. That if we have the courage to have faith, Christ is there with us. Christ is our helper. Christ was the person who could help us to take risks. Christ can help us to take our initiative. Through prayer, maybe he will speak to you. Christ can help us to be that sensitive, caring person. And above all, it is Christ who helps me to trust. To trust in God for my everyday needs. So that's Miriam as a young child. But what happens to Miriam after this? Did she continue to be a courageous, obedient, sensitive, practical, caring woman? Well, she seems to disappear from the story until several decades later, when Moses had been chosen by God to lead the Israelites out of Egypt into the Promised Land. And she next appears in Exodus chapter 15. After God had parted the seas to enable them to escape from Egypt, Miriam encouraged the other Israelite women to join her as she led a song of thanksgiving and praise to God for his deliverance. It's written, then Miriam the prophet, so she was known as a prophet. So Miriam the prophet and Aaron's, Aaron's sister took a timbrel in her hand and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang to them, 
Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. And then she appears once more in the book of Numbers, chapter 12, when during their journey through the wilderness, Miriam grumbled about Moses having married a foreigner. Moses had married a Cushite woman. Miriam attacked his leadership and recognised that Miriam had lost her trust in God. God struck her down with leprosy. But her brother Aaron turned to Moses. Please, my Lord, I ask you not to hold against us the sin we have so foolishly committed. And Moses cried out to the Lord, Please, God, heal her. Miriam was put out of the camp for seven days, and the entire two million Israelites waited for her to get well before moving on. And once she was healed, the Israelites continued on their journey. And there's no other mention of Miriam in the Bible until her death is described in the first verse of the book of Numbers, chapter 20. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There Miriam died and was buried. What a woman. When we saw that we were looking at the children of the Bible this summer, and I was asked to speak on Miriam, I was really pleased. I saw through this young child, someone who went on to become a huge leader in a way, a prophet. And it sort of thinks me back to people, one or two in my own family, who as a child were obviously encouraged and taught and became Christians and had really quite some leadership roles. What can we do? Above all, let us trust in God. Let us pray. Let us pray that we can be like Miriam, be someone who is willing to follow God, who can be full of courage and trust, someone who is willing to take risks for the sake of our faith and trust in God. Amen. Amen. Stop this recording.